Do you wanna up your influencer marketing game? Do you wanna meet more influencers, have a better working relationship with influencers? You might even be struggling to talk to them in the first place or even get them to talk about your product and post to their audiences. Well, at Winning with Shopify, we have teamed up with Affluencer, which is an app you can install on Shopify and it comes with a 30 day trial. And even in those first 30 days, you can meet a load of influencers and start promoting your product. So there's no excuse, go and install the app, start the 30 day trial and give it a go yourself and see how you get on. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Winning with Shopify podcast. For anyone that's not seen before, I'm so happy you're listening to this episode because this week I had the amazing Kieran from my SEO team here at my agency Spec and our website is spec.digital. Need any help with SEO or PPC on Google Ads um, and lots of other channels then come reach out to us and come have a chat. Before I talk about today's episode, and all the crazy things Kieran and I started talking about, a couple of which are slightly funny and slightly uh, interesting as to how we brought them up, uh, talking about SEO. And before that, check out the Growth Hub if you haven't already. Um, it is exclusively for Shopify brands. If you're not on Shopify, we'll let you in anyway. Um, but it is just for e-commerce brands. There's no other agency selling anything. And the only people in there are my team, and we are here to help. We do not push our own services. We just help you guys with all of your questions. We also have almost every single week a different rounds table that we have been running as as well. So we've been talking about email marketing. We've done one on SEO and PPC, of course. Uh, we're doing one on influencer marketing. We've got some other stuff coming up where we've got some guests joining us from some very, very successful businesses where people in our community can come along and ask them questions and start debates and, and start discussing things or say, I've got this issue on my website at the moment or on my Shopify store. Can you help? So go and join the Growth Hub. It's absolutely amazing and it only exists for you guys. So go to wwspodcast.com. Should be up on the screen as well. Thank you, Sophie and Josh, our editors, for putting that there. Um, but yeah, click on that or click on a link or type that into a browser and go to the Growth Hub, join the waiting list, and we will get you guys in there nice and quickly. Today, I want your SEO to be better, and I want you guys to get more revenue from your SEO listings especially as well. So Kieran and I are uncovering how Google is looking at websites at the moment, and we built a list of 10 things that we alternated through each point today. But the 10 things that we find so many brands when we first get talking to or audit their website or talk about them becoming a client, these are the kind of things we're working on. So we're giving away some of our secret sauce today. And um, if you want help with any of them, you've got any questions, um, I say at the end of the episode as well. But yeah, SEO at spec, S-P-E-C dot digital. So SEO at spec.digital. Drop us an email. That email address comes through to Kira, myself, and the whole team here. Uh, just say that you were listening to the podcast and I heard your point on this. Could you look at that on my store for me? And we'll have a quick look. But anyway, on to today's hilarious list. You guys are finding these quite funny, so I'm going to keep doing them. Um, we talked today about green jumpers. As you can see, I'm wearing a green jumper if you're watching on YouTube. Little plug. Check out our YouTube channel. Hit subscribe. Give us some likes um, and engage. We talk about green jumpers, push chairs, crazy ex-boyfriends and girlfriends, <laughs> holding pages on websites, internet time travel, and then a whole list of other things from sitemaps to keywords to content to how to lay your collections out to how to get to number one and bully your competitors in the process. I hope you enjoy today's episode, not to be missed. So Kieran, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Yeah, feeling good. Thank you, Nick. How are you? It's, I'm very well, thank you, very well. And as you guys can see, Kieran and I have colour coordinated with green tops, um, ready for today's show. Kieran's a bit cold, which is why he's got his coat on. Um, but Kieran, for anyone who has not been to any of our webinars, you've not been on the podcast before, you've been on webinars, give us a little background to where you work, what you do, um, and then I'll introduce what we're talking about today. Uh, hey guys, so yeah, I, I work at Spec Digital for Nick. Um, I work as an SEO executive. Um, I've been in SEO for around six, seven years now. I love it. I breathe it. I live it. Yeah, it's kind of me really. Um, but yeah, that's my intro. Over to you, amazing, Nick. amazing. And Kieran is very technical, guys, which is one of the reasons I really wanted to get him on today. Um, we're going to be talking, as you can probably see about the t uh, through the title, um, we're going to be talking about Shopify SEO today and how to improve the SEO of your stores. Um, Kieran and I have written out 10 amazing things that we think every brand should do. And most importantly, things that we find almost every single brand that we start working with in our agency here are missing, haven't done, don't know what they are, haven't thought about. And um, most of them as well, if you get them right, will see a revenue uplift pretty quickly as well. So today is going to be a tag team between Kieran and I. Kieran, you're going to kick us off. What is the first thing that every brand should be doing and quite often is not? Okay, sweet. So the first thing I would consider is just keyword tracking. So a lot of brands, they just release their website, they make it live, they don't do any SEO to it. Um, they leave it for years and they're not entirely sure what they're actually ranking for. 
Um, so there is a way around this. There are free tools out there like Google Search Console, which is very handy on knowing what people are searching to find you um, and what your impressions and clicks are. Um, but I think the main issue with these sort of tools is it doesn't show you keyword opportunities. It only shows you what you're ranking for. Um, but it's still very important. We do see a lot of brands come along and they're not entirely sure what their focus keyword is or where they even rank their focus keyword, um, which is always a little bit of a worry. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my answer for that. Nice. And just to add to that, I always find, um, and I know you'll spend most of your life, Kieran, in the data, don't you? Um, you find in the data so many interesting things like we're currently fifth for this keyword. It's got 100,000 searches a month and we're getting like 50 to 100 clicks, like literally 50 to 100. And then you get that keyword from fifth to first with not a huge amount of effort. And suddenly you're getting more like 20 to 40,000 clicks a month for it. Like it's a game changer for so many businesses. So, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely get those things tracked. Awesome. Number two, then. So over to me. Um, we we like to break SEO into three levels of optimization. Um, the first level is just mentioning the keyword on the page. I know it sounds really obvious. I'm going to come back to that. The second level then is having the best website and user experience for that keyword. So Google wants to send traffic to you. And the third level then is getting lots of other websites to say that you are the best website for that keyword. Uh, and that's your backlinking and your brand awareness and stuff. The amount of brands that come along and we ask them during our pitch process or during the first kind of conversation, what would you want to be number one for on Google? Like give us three, five, 10 different keywords you would like to be number one on Google for. Um, and so often we then just go on the site and literally just do command F or control F on a Windows machine, command F on, uh, on a Mac and just search the keyword. And we find they're not even mentioning that keyword. And it's like you're actively telling Google it's not relevant. So the entire universe of keywords are not relevant unless you put them on the page. And we're going to talk a bit, a bit more as we go through. And certainly on the next point, Kieran's going to talk a bit more about how we, um, how we actually do that. But one, one client in particular, we said to them, you know, what do you want to be number one for? They said to us this particular keyword. And we went on their landing page and, and looked at a few different pages of the site and said, yeah, they're super relevant to this. And their reviews say that they are the best pretty much in the country for this particular thing. And then we searched and it didn't mention the keyword at all. They had pictures of people using the product, um, enjoying the product and making the most of the experience, but almost not a single mention across the entire site. And the keyword had two words in it and they hadn't mentioned either word, let alone it as a phrase. So we quite quickly said, well, we'll make those changes, shall we? And see, uh, <laughs> and see what starts to happen. Um, point three, Kieran, talk us through another place we need to mention those keywords. Oh, sure. And the heading hierarchy. So we see a lot at spec, especially like a Shopify client will come along and, and they'll say, you know, that their SEO is not great and they're not ranking so well for keywords. And sure, they'll have H1s all over the place. You know, Shopify does allow that, especially as the title when you're in the back end of Shopify. Um, but you tend to forget the H2, the H3, the H4. Um, and Google absolutely loves a heading hierarchy. So it loves a H1, it loves a H2, it loves having a couple of H3s in there. It breaks the content out. But yeah, what we tend to see, especially with Shopify, is people do miss out a lot on their headings. Uh, it's really important to put the keywords in there. It'll really help the rankings if it's in the H1, H2. Um, and yeah, it's just really helpful to use. And we see it a lot. Clients aren't using it. It's not super obvious in Shopify how to add a heading. Um, but once you figure it out, it's very simple and it's really effective. So it's worth doing. Mm. So, yeah. and in terms of the clients we take on or do an audit of or review, how many of them have this kind of, I don't want to say problem, but like missed opportunity, how many of them have not looked yeah, at Yeah, a ton, an absolute ton. We see a lot on product pages. It's really hard to squeeze a H2 into a product page because I'm sure a H1 would be like product name. Um, you know, normally there's a H2 skipped and then the H3 is normally like key information or dimensions or something like that. It's quite hard to fit in, but if you can and you manage to find the right keyword for these products and put it in the H2, maybe in the little product description, um, yeah, it can be really beneficial for SEO. So definitely something people miss out yeah. on. And we've actually noticed, haven't we, where Google sometimes grabs, if the H2s are relevant to what the H1s introduced on the whole page, Google will grab that snippet under the H2, won't it, and go, so say you're looking at, a, at buying a push chair, you could have a little snippet underneath saying push chair or pram, and Google actually grabs that because people search, should I buy a push chair or a pram? And the best thing is if they come in, they're not landing on like a blog post, buying guide, they're landing on a product that's got a buy now button. So you're going to get some sales from that, from people that go, okay, I was umming and ahhing. This is confirmed. I need a push chair. And this is a beautiful push chair. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really does help with the snippets. So yeah, worth using. Nice. 
And actually, Kieran, that leads me on really nicely to point number four, um, which I'm going to talk about. And when we talk about that content throughout the page, especially on a product page, so many brands that we talk to look at and, and sometimes, um, and you're going to talk about this a little bit later as well, about UX and, and CRO and the buying decisions and that kind of thing. But the content level, when we say content is king in SEO, Google does not want to rank a site that when you land on a collection, it's just got a list of products and nothing else. There's no brand story. There's no value adds. There's nothing to say, hey, here's how you make your decision. Here's your buying guide. Here's your sizing guide. Here's your filters to find the products you want. If you've got none of that, you're not going to rank very well. And even more so when you land on the actual product page itself, and it just says, here are some functional box ticks and numbers about this product, the size, the weight, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, if you're looking at buying like an item of clothing, this is not a part for like a machine where it is, I need the exact size, the exact measurements. It's got to be the right durability and it has to meet so many requirements. That actually, I am buying purely on features here. And then I might choose who I buy from based on some of the benefits, you know, how quickly it arrives, the price, et cetera. But when you're buying clothing and fashion items and, and more luxury items or something for the house, actually talking to customers in your content is so important to say this product goes well in this kind of room or it works with this kind of um like i saw on a, on a fashion site the other day where they actually put like um whatever they almost had a table and it was like whatever your eye color is these are the perfect colors for you to wear as uh, as tops and i thought that's a really interesting piece of content that i haven't seen enough but you go to any stylist and you know any kind of tailor they'll look take one look at your eyes um, and your hair color and, and um, whether you've got a beard or not and go this is these are the suit colors for you these will suit you much more than these ones you know don't if you don't have brown eyes don't wear a brown suit is uh, is something i learned when uh, when i was buying a suit last and so i think that um additional content is so important and certainly for people like yourself and and, and me kira like it gives us something to actually work with as well like technical is great but the content is so important isn't it yeah definitely on page is always the top content will always be king uh, so yeah, make sure Absolutely. you optimize for that. Yeah, yeah. And point number five, Kieran, talk us through. Uh, talk us through the next one. Yeah, absolutely. So point number five is just creating collections. Um, obviously, you know, there's two ways to this. There's there's too many collections or there's too little collections. So we had a client recently. They're sort of into like designer fashion and this sort of, this sort of stuff. Um, and what we found was they had, I think it was around thirteen collections, but they had anywhere between sort of fifteen to thirty. 30,000 products. So it was a bit like, where are all these products going? You know, they can't all just fit into 13 collections. Now we have limited time with this client, but we did decide to break out lots of different collections into their top designers or their top brands or, or anything like that. I mean, you could do it separately. You could do it into uh, trousers or tops or anything like that. Um, but for us, yeah, it was just doing it by the top brands and it just leads to more conversions because you're sending traffic from point A, which is a collection with 10,000 products to point B, which is a collection with just 60 products. And people are much more likely to filter through 60 products and look through 10,000 products. No one has time for that. So yeah, it's worth definitely bre like branching out your collections, you know, websites like an octopus, the more tentacles it has pages. For this example, the more food it can catch, so the exact same. Collections are very conversional. I know a lot of people convert on the product pages, but obviously they go to the collection pages first unless they're looking for a direct product. So yeah, branch your collections out. Make sure, make sure your website's clear and it's easy to understand and people know what they're looking for. So yeah, just make it accessible. Absolutely. And and just like you said on point number one as well, like do it around keywords. Don't just go, this would be a nice collection. I mean, that's fine for other marketing like email or maybe even advertising where you can send people, put a message in front of them and they come in. But actually, when we're trying to organically get traffic and, and rankings for collections, like call the collections a keyword. So if somebody searches for, um, as we're saying, like a particular designer or something or a particular brand, have a collection for that brand, have sub collections underneath if you've got enough products. Um, and start branching out, which I absolutely love. Um, bringing that into point number six, something that can actually get um, worse and be harmed by all the things we've, well, almost all the things we've suggested so far. And point number six really is about page speed. And anyone that's ever worked in marketing or e-commerce will know page speed is so important. And one of the things we found with Shopify, especially, and talking to Shopify developers and agencies is, so many of them have come to us and said that, um, you know, like oh, Shopify locks all the back end files 
we can't actually access half the files we need to to make Shopify any faster. This is as good as it's going to get. Uh, they're all wrong. They're completely wrong. And I've got proof. So we, we've got several clients now who um, it's not necessarily been easy, but we're starting to pick up the same sort of things through and through. Um, but we've got several clients that are mobile page speed on Google page speed insights. We're now between 60 and 80 um, out of 100. Um, many of them starting to hit the green zone as well. What we're finding is if we make no other changes but improve page speed, the same moment that we've improved page speed, conversion rates go up as well. There is so much to be said for a site that just loads really quickly, especially when so many of us are sitting in our offices working on our Shopify stores and we're on a desktop in a really fast internet connection, probably sitting in a city somewhere, or we're at home and we're the only one using the Wi-Fi network right now. That's not where your customers shop. Like go and jump on a train and get out of the biggest city you can find on a train during rush hour and try and get that website to load quickly on a mobile device. You can't. And that's why, that's why it's so important to start optimizing that. Um, I often make the joke on the side of a mountain. If you can get your site to load quickly on the side of a mountain or on a commuter train out of, uh, out of London or New York or LA or wherever, um, now you're starting to, to make some headway and you will see sales increase because people trust the website because it just loads really quickly and it's a seamless user experience. Which leads me on nicely to point number seven, Kieran. Talk mm -hmm. us through the next one. Sweet. So... We always suggest UX tracking. So UX stands for user experience. So there's many tools out there you can use. So for example, you can use Hotjar, you can use Yandex Metrica, you can use Microsoft Clarity. There's loads out there. I think the one issue with UX tracking is it will slightly slow down the site. So just for the next point about site speed, sometimes you've got to sacrifice your leg to keep walking. Sounds a bit weird. So yeah, adding these sort of softwares can slow the site down very slightly. So I wouldn't recommend it having tracking software on your site all year round, or at least UX tracking software all year round. Um, but it's really handy to do so because it can really point out where your website might be failing. We have a really good example of a client that sells contemporary furniture. Um, we had a lot of issues where there was a bit of uh, finger pointing, just sort of saying, you know, why isn't conversions coming through? And we were sort of sitting there thinking, well, traffic's there. So what, what's going wrong what's what's the issue so what we decided to do was just use microsoft clarity have a look and we kind of figured out that a lot of their products were on pre-order so we highly suggested right let's change pre-order to extended order delivery so instead of it saying pre-order wait four to six weeks for your product it'll be order now um and then you know sort of three to four week wait instead of saying pre-order and we did we saw an increase in conversions um and it was overnight once it was all changed so it really does show that sometimes your wording can really put people off whereas you know if you reword it or reshuffle it or change it up a little bit it can really help and can really change your conversion rate so yeah worth doing worth checking yeah, yeah. And what I love about this point, and I think if there's one we should emphasize the most on today's episode, it's probably this about user experience. Google absolutely loves it where we highlight something that has been annoying customers, annoying users on the site and fix it. Sometimes it, they almost put you higher than other sites that didn't have a problem in the first place, because at least you're being proactive. So one of the most daunting things I think that any e-commerce manager or founder or anyone can hear is, oh, you've got to keep making changes and keep doing stuff for SEO to be effective. That's quite daunting until you think about conversion rate in UX. Um, we've got a test going on at the moment and I don't have the results yet, but I have asked the client if we can share them and he's gone, yeah, absolutely fine. Um, and it's a CRO agency running it. We fed into it and um, we've just quadrupled the length of their product pages without affecting page speed, but adding tons more information in. Um, it's only been live three or four days at the time of recording this. So I'm so excited to go. We've gone gung ho from like nothing to everything on the page. Not everything's going to be relevant, but the plan right now is let's just do it. See um, conversion rates increase. And once we've seen them increase, then we'll start removing it bit by removing kind of one feature at a time as an A-B test to see which one had the most impact, basically, to then learn like, okay, customers don't care about this. We can shrink the page back down a bit. Conversion rate's still there. Um, but we've added so much about like who the brand are and everything else and actually looking at customer service queries as well and feeding that into the contents where people contact customer service say, my products arrived, like it feels really thin. Am I, is this going to keep me warm? Am I okay to use this on a hike through Norway? Um, and it, it's like, well, actually, that's a really important piece of content becomes USP for the product. And Google loves that. We're listening to 
to customers making a change to our user experience. And again, bringing it back to that most important thing, content. We're writing content about the things that customers really care about. Half of it will boost keywords and the other half of the content will just boost conversion, which also boosts the keyword because Google doesn't want to send traffic to a site no one buys from. It wants to send traffic to a site where people go, I've found this website on Google, I've made my decision, I'm buying this product, I'm not going anywhere else. And Google can obviously see all of that activity. Um, and Kieran, this isn't one of the points on our list, but let's talk about this quickly. How surprised were you? Um, were you as surprised as I was when we got the leak um, released? Uh, we were reading about it in spec. How surprised were you when you read about Chrome watching users around the whole internet? The Google Chrome exists for SEO and no other reason initially. Yeah. Well, we knew it was happening anyway. Google's the big... Google are almost like the government of the internet at the moment. Uh, well, if, yeah, as long as you're not on the dark web. But um, yeah, so it, <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. They've been watching for years. They've been watching since the 90s. Um, and plus... They collect all our data. So they want to know what we're up to. They want to see what's going on. So I wasn't super surprised. Google's very nosy. Um, but it's nice to know we can confirm it now because they have been denying it for many years. So the fact that it's finally come out in this leak was really grand to hear. So, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Which does make SEO a bit more fun, doesn't it? Than uh, we, we always used to focus on this for a conversion perspective because that's people don't buy us to get to number one on Google. They, they buy our services, obviously, and or do SEO in the first place to make more money. Um, so yeah, it was quite reassuring, actually, that all the stuff we do on site, Google is using, watching, regardless of Google Analytics or anything else actually running. Do you ever find that in your warehouse you have dead stock? You can't sell it, no one wants to buy it, and you can't get a refund on it. Or alternatively, you're missing inventory in your warehouse that you need. You've got sales coming in and you're low on stock and you haven't ordered more stock in time. All these things hit profit. And I've been there. I've run my own Shopify store and had exactly that problem. But we've partnered it up with Inventory Planner, who have the most incredible app to help you manage that and forecast exactly what products, what SKUs, even down to what color of product you need to order in advance to make sure stock levels remain consistent throughout. They're also running a seven day boot camp. And if you want to go and sign up to that, it's seven emails over seven days. And it takes the same amount of time as your morning coffee. And in seven days, like me, you can become an inventory management pro. Both links are in the description. Enjoy. XML sitemaps. So we're going to get technical and apologies if this sounds boring. You get this wrong. There's no point doing any SEO whatsoever. Um, Shopify pumps out an XML sitemap. It's like XML is like a giant spreadsheet. Um, you can actually import it into a spreadsheet and it looks like one. But an XML file lists every single page on your website and a few little bits of information about that page, like when it was launched, last updated, how important it is, how often it's updated. And Shopify does this automatically. So why am I bringing it up? Well, you can break the system very easily without realizing. So one of the biggest things that Google Search Console, which we mentioned right at the start about keyword tracking, it doesn't just track keywords, it also audits your site, it does other stuff. And it is Google telling you what Google thinks. So it's the most important tool as far as I'm concerned on, on SEO. And, and, and I'm happy to be proven wrong on that, but I won't be. It's, uh, it really is the most important tool. Um, but on there, it will tell you if you've got a page in your sitemap that you've also added a no index tag to. So what's happened is Google's gone to your website, it's found the XML sitemap, and it's going through page by page and looking at all these pages you've told it to. And it reaches some of those pages and you've said, don't index this, Google. And Google gets the huff and goes, well, hang on a minute, you're telling me to look at this page. And then when I get there, you're telling me not to index it or look at it or take it into account. So don't give me the runaround. Don't waste my time is what Google is, is, uh, is saying through Google Search Console. So it's very easy to do on Shopify. And especially if you're on Plus, but you can do some stuff not on Plus as well to actually modify what does appear in your XML sitemap and what doesn't. To take this a level further, we have some clients that have, like one, one in particular has over 100 million pages and results showing on Google. 100 million results on Google. So just... Think about how big that is. And they have over 100 million pages on the website, but Google doesn't look at anywhere near that many. There's a thing called a crawl budget. Google will actually get bored looking at your site. And to be perfectly frank, regardless of your size, almost every single site will be hitting its crawl budget because Google would determine that crawl budget based on how much of the site it thinks it needs to look at to get the pages that it needs. So also revealed in the leak and where XML sitemaps become even more important is you do not want Google wasting time on pages that don't convert, that have high bounce rates and everything else. Because say Google's looking at 100 of your blog posts, 10 of your products and 10 of your collections. 
that's a hundred pages where people don't convert and you might have quite a high bounce rate because people search for something, search for a problem, they land on your blog and they get the answer. So then they leave, they've finished, they've, they've got what they wanted. doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing blogs, but we need to be a lot smarter about how we uh, hook people in. So how we get them to go from seeing a blog post to filling out an email address and joining our newsletter or filling out a blog post and browsing some products or is, is the answer to the problem your product? So talk about your product and don't give in. And this is where marketing and sales comes in. Don't give too much away on the, um, the actual blog post itself or the article, or the buying guide or whatever that bit of content is. Give most of your answers on the product page where there's a big buy button and some of your USPs and a reason to purchase this thing today. So actually the sitemap is so important to make sure Google is spending its time looking at the right pages, reading the right things, and therefore only ranking pages that you want them to rank. And something we saw in the the leak, didn't we, Kieran? I don't know if you want to talk a bit more about this as well, is loads of dead pages is very, very bad. Like every page should be used. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Just a quick FYI, though, Google mm. still looks at your no-index pages. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't put them in the SERPs. It's very strange, Google. Oh, I don't want so to see So it is these... wasting time, isn't it? Yeah. <sighs> You know, it's saying, I don't, you know, I don't want to see these awful high bounce rate pages, but Google will still go look in. They still want to know that they're like crazy X. It's like, oh, I don't stalk you, but they still do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so bear that in mind. But I think with Shopify, obviously, lots of products coming in, lots of collections, you know, it's big e-commerce uh, sort of CMS. Um, yeah, it's worth just, like Nick said, keep your uh, crawl budget low. Make sure the important pages are there. Don't just get rid of pages because you think they're not useful because some of them might be useful. It's also worth checking the data to make sure that a page is or isn't useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that talking about the Google leak leads us on nicely actually to point number nine where Google's even more creepy than we thought. Tell us about point number nine, Kieran. Point number nine is domain age. Uh, so obviously there's no, you can't control this. You can't, you know, I can't just build a website tomorrow and go right put 10 years of I don't know being on the internet on there we can't so it's not something you can necessarily change but it's worth reviewing so have a look at your competitors find out when was their domain purchased when did it go live um yeah Google's been lying for years saying domain age isn't a ranking factor but luckily this leak proved that it very much is uh, so if you're sat there thinking about running a Shopify website or, or a WordPress website or anything like that Get it live ASAP because all your competitors have been in the market for 10, 20, 30 years, some of them. And trust me, Google's going to make sure they're above you because they trust them and they trusted them for the last 20 years. Whereas they don't trust you that you've only just come on on the Internet. Um, so, yeah, bear that in mind. And please, yeah, just just review your competitors. It, the problem is also, I'll add, is that uh, Google will sandbox you for the first year or two don't know the exact timings but we reckon about a year or two so once your website's first live google almost puts you in this box that says we don't trust you yet we don't know you we don't know who you are what you stand for what your plan is uh, so just bear that in mind when releasing a website it's a you know it's a marathon not a sprint so give it time yeah and we've seen some sites get indexed really quickly but they've basically gone viral uh you know like they're all over social media and all over the news and google's like all right we're normally supposed to sit in the sandbox for at least a few months, if not, as you say, like a year or two in, in some cases. But you're making too much noise, which I think is the good news that if you're sitting there going, well, I was going to rely quite heavily on SEO and my domain's completely new and I haven't launched it yet. All is not lost, but you you have got to prove that you're better. And that it's not, I guess, what the good point to make here that we've not made at all in this episode, but we make a lot about SEO is um, Google's trying to do what's best for the user. Sometimes without the user even knowing it's a thing. And I put cookies and stuff in that category where Google and the EU and the US government are all arguing about cookies at the moment. Um, no one even knows what a cookie is unless you're really nerdy like Kieran and I in the industry and then kind of look at them on a regular basis. Um, but they do some things for your own good, but sometimes, and, and this one in particular, if you're a new brand, you've got to convince customers that you're worth buying from. So Google just takes the same stance and says, I'm not just going to endorse you and chuck you up at the top of Google unless you've got a monopoly on something or no one's there. Um, or something's gone really viral and everyone's saying, this is the craziest new product, toy, whatever, um, that everybody's talking about. But you can still drive some of those articles. And I think certainly when you launch a new product, 
phone a thousand journalists or email them all and literally just say to every last one of them, like, um, you know, th this is the product everybody's been waiting for, or everybody's talking about this, or on this date, I've got tons of articles going out. We've got a big press launch, big campaign. Everyone's going to be talking about it. And we'd love your newspaper to talk about it as well. Um, you know, you do an article on it as well. And you kind of build that hype, uh, which, which would help massively with this. Um, we, we, we also like i'm a big fan i don't know if you've done much with this kieran actually i, I can't think of any examples that's spare, but i'm a big fan when new brands are launching to actually just do like a, a a welcome page that just says hey we're launching soon put your email address in that's a way of getting around that domain domain age isn't it yes absolutely yes put the site live without saying it's ready the google can really yeah. see it so that they know you're there so yeah it's a good idea i think yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, oh, absolutely. There is just one more point just for that one. Um, Google has recently introduced Wayback Machine into the results. So Wayback Machine, if people don't know, is a tool that allows you to see the history of a website. So put any website into Wayback Machine, more than likely you'll be able to see back a couple of years, four or five years ago, what it looked like, whether they've changed it, changed the layout. You know, it's really cool. But they've added it to the SERPs now. And that is just proof that Google is looking at your age. Like, what have you done? Your history. It's it's showing people. It wants to show people. Um, so, yeah, take that with a pinch of salt, I guess. But, yeah, Google is watching. Creepy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I, I like to call it internet time travel, the Wayback Machine, because you literally... You're going back in time, and you can actually click around and, like, use a load of functions on the site. You probably can't purchase and stuff. It's smart and that. But Wayback Machine is not part of Google. Google's like adopted it and started using it. And and that's not actually uncommon. Um, something we're not talking about at, at all today is schema. Um, we mentioned earlier about their header tags, making your listing bigger or pulling a bit of content out the page and using that almost as its own listing rather than the main page, like the title and message description and stuff. Um, but actually even schema is, schema.org is a website which was made by some nerdy developers. Um, I was saying nerdy a lot today. There's, SEO can be very nerdy. Um, but yeah, some developers made a thing called schema. Google's like, oh, that's cool. And it's called, Google's called it structured data but it is all schema and it's exactly the same as schema code and they reference schema a lot. So when we talk about backlinks, there's no better backlink than Google's own um, domain and own help area for SEO webmasters saying, hey, check out schema.org. So you look up any type of schema and it is like Google versus schema, who's going to rank number one. And then all your normal kind of SEO agencies or experts saying what to do with this particular um, schema issue. And the last one, number 10, um, is about collection structure. Now, I know, Kieran, you mentioned earlier about um, how to make more collections and expand that collection, um, those collections themselves. <coughs> taking this to another level and speaking slightly, uh, almost kind of taking a side to the, uh, you know, a sidestep on this. We help clients a lot look at what collections to make. And the example Kieran gave was like, you sell this range of products and you've got 2,000 products for this. You don't even have a collection for it. Let's make one. So actually there was an issue there with just the total site hierarchy and revenue is flying and it's going up and up and up the more collections that the guys are making. It's become a real focus. What I want to talk about actually is the user journey, which is another point we had as well, through the collections. Now, what some brands are doing at the moment, and some are doing it really well, and some are making a tiny, tiny mistake, which is completely killing this, is when you land on a big, broad uh, collection, say you land on women's, so any item that is specifically for the female gender is in that collection called women's. A lot of sites use filters, so then you can go, all right, I'm just looking for uh, bottoms. So I'm just going to filter it now by bottoms. All right, I want some tracksuit bottoms, not trousers, not jeans, not denim, nothing. I want some tracksuit bottoms. So I'll click the tracksuit filter and stuff like that. If you're using filters and your URL has like question mark equals um, product variant uh, tracksuit bottoms, for example, and uh, women's as well, Google only sees one page and that one page is women's. It will not see the tracksuit bottoms collection. And also it's not the nicest user journey or it could be better it's not terrible but it could be better than people using like drop downs and filters and what lots of brands have actually done now um, and i'll give you a good example of this on on women's is you land on the women's collection and you have a sort of a, a big h1 title as kieran said with a little description welcome to our women's area and here's a button that goes to our buying guide if you're um want to know more about our products and which ones to buy and then underneath that before you get to the actual list of products has a load of little icons or even little pictures with a word underneath linking off to another collection 
which is like a level two collection. So women's is level one. And then you've got all the level twos. So that could be like accessories, tops, bottoms, underwear, pajamas. And you have all these kind of left to right. And on a mobile device, it's really, really slick because it's basically like working with a stylist. Because you, you, like you walk into a shop and somebody greets you at the door and they say, hey, what are you looking for today? And it says, well, I'm looking for something for me and I'm a man. So and they're like, oh, great. Menswear's over here. And on the walk there, they say, anything specific you're looking for? So, yeah, I'm looking for a new jumper, actually. And they're like, great, the jumpers are this way. And so on the site, you've gone into the men's area, then you've clicked on the little icon for jumpers. And then when you land on that, using your customer data and website data and looking at what people buy, you should know what the next variant is. Is it based on the size? So it says, you know, what size of jumper are you? Or is it the color? If you say, okay, I really want to, like, I'm, like Kieran and I are wearing green tops today, as I made a joke earlier. I would really like a green one. So you click green, and now you're on a filtered list of all men's jumpers that are green. And then you can filter it after that down to size, for example. It's such a good user experience. But because you're clicking on a button and loading another collection, every single one of those collections has its own SEO keyword, and Google can see them. If you do it as filters, it's highly likely Google can't actually see those filters. But you see how the site's got a really nice smooth structure now that actually, although we still need to write some blog posts and some buying guides and all that jazz, Google's less worried about all of that stuff now because it's like, well, your site's great. I drop someone in at the men. Some, if I'm looking for like, you know, comfortable men's jumpers or whatever, I drop them in at the men's jumpers page. They click through three or four more pages. Like they use your site loads and then they start clicking on products and it's a great user journey for the user and it's great for customers, but all the other things we've said today, this needs to be in your sitemap, it needs to load quickly. Um, and we need to make sure as well that you've got enough content in all of them for people to make buying decisions. But how much stronger is their buying decision going to be if they've gone from men's jumpers, green, medium size, et cetera, et cetera, medium size, and then maybe even material. Do you want organic vegan cotton? Do you want uh, lamb's wool? Do you want a mix of all of those? Do you want po um, polythene or polystyrene, whatever it's called? It's not polystyrene. Um, polyester, that's it, polyester material. So you can kind of work your way down into all of those things and give, and you could, even all the way along the way, you could make one bold with a little star on it saying, we recommend our, we recommend the, the blue jumpers. We have an amazing range of blue jumpers. So you can kind of drive people a little bit into the right place. And again, Chrome is watching all of that. And Google Wayback Machine will go, wow, you've really improved um, the whole experience from what it used to look like to what it looks like um, today. And we, we've done this on quite a few clients. And we have conversations, especially around Black Friday, where people say, yeah, we've got a Black Friday collection. And then we've got 20 filtered versions of it. And we're like, no, 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 make 20 collections. Make the same same button looks the same as a filter um, or make it look different. So when people land on Black Friday, it's like we've got 20 different ranges under our Black Friday. And on a mobile, you can just kind of scroll left to right, put some little arrows on it so people know there's loads of them and scroll left to right to find the right one. And you'll probably see conversion rates absolutely fly. SEO improves as a result because um, we're also now driving more users to certain pages. And that was a big thing in the leak that Google said is um, if people don't visit a page, Google's probably not going to rank it at all. So whether that's through your site already or whether people are landing on it from Google, it's a combination of the two. Any, anything to add on the collection structure at all, Kieran? Anything that you've, you've worked on recently? Or? Nothing in my end. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, look, I really appreciate your time, Kieran. It's been great to have you on. And if anybody has any questions about any of this, reach out to us. You can use SEO at spec, S-P-E-C dot digital. Comes to Kieran, myself, the whole SEO team here. Happy to pick up any questions. Just put on that email, SEO at spec digital. Just put in the subject line or in the email somewhere like, I heard you guys talking about this particular point on the podcast. Could you have a look at that on my site for us? We'd be more than happy to have a, have a quick peek and, uh, and see what's going on. Equally, as I would have said right at the start in, in, in the introduction as well, check out the Growth Hub. Um, is our community. It's for Shopify brands only. Go and sign up there. We're letting people in like crazy at the moment. There are, there's well over 100 brands now in our community and it's growing and growing and growing. And, um, yeah, and Kieran and myself and loads of our SEO team are in there as well. So you can ask us lots of questions, talk to other brands. Um, and that's the thing. But yeah, Kieran, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining yeah, us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Great stuff. And for everyone listening, back again next Friday. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, leave us a review, and we hope to see you again in a week's time. Does your email marketing suck? Do you wish it converted better and integrated better with your store? Well, there is a solution. We've partnered with Saguno, who are an email platform that is built into Shopify, which means you don't have to leave Shopify to go and manage your email campaigns. So you can run your marketing at the same place you run your shop. To learn more, you can claim your free customer analysis and strategy session and visit saguno.com forward slash winning with Shopify. That's S-E-G-U-N-O dot com forward slash winning with Shopify. Seguno is made for merchants, not marketers.